Visual Basic, C Sharp, I, yeah, duh. And you guys, same thing? Database. Database. You know what? I always, whenever I hear people in my class talking about other classes, I assume that I'm not giving enough work. So <laughs> I'll correct that going forward. Yeah, too late, too late. I, I often wish I could be like, like they say, the proverbial fly on the wall, like during your C-sharp class, maybe before it, you know. Uh, at any rate, um, yeah, I'm just kidding about that. Um, I know my classes are so entertaining that they are the first thing that you do, even at the expense of socializing and... Um, you know, recreational activities. And so you get the, all those assignments done and out of the way, and then you have to do the boring stuff that other professors have you do. So oh, I. My only recreational activity? <laughs> oh, I love this. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's funny too. I mean, I, I, I love the program. I mean, I, I offer to help people with their websites, I, I love to do it. And it's like, you know, and I'll write programs even that do like image manipulation and stuff like that and some audio manipulation. And again, it's like, I'm not like I'm going to sell them or anything, but it's like they're just fun to do. Christmas. There you go. There you go. Um, all right. Um, we're going to gravitate now over the next couple classes to talking about, to, to putting our designer hats on. Um, we, we talked, uh, you know, I, I talked about the dual nature of web development, how it, there's a technical aspect and there's a design aspect, and it, that exists on really every level. And I mean, that exists on every level of software development, period. You know, as far as developing user interfaces, developing algorithms to do a particular problem that I just heard talking about designing databases. Um, there's always a design portion uh, of it. And then there's also the technical, because you have to be able to, to, to actually put it in, into work once you've figured out what you're going to do. So I kind of, um, I take a broader view of what constitutes web design. A lot of people, when they talk about web design, talk purely about aesthetics. In other words, what it looks like, what fonts to use, what colors to use. And that's an important aspect of web design, but by no means is it the only aspect. So what I want to do is I want to have a discussion of web design. And this is a topic that everyone probably thinks they're an expert in. If not an expert, everyone has an opinion, right? It's like watching the Olympics. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. You watch figure skating, for example. And you look, and after one's done, you know, you know as much as the judges. It's like, yeah, no, I can't see why that one got that high of a score. They missed that triple saw cow, and they fell down, and so on. So everyone has an expert. Everyone has an opinion on that. So I think it's the same about web design. People know the kinds of web pages they like, and they know the kind of web pages that they don't like. What our job, though, is to go deeper than that. Our job is to look not just uh, on a, um, um, a, a, a gut reaction level of I like this, I don't like it, this good, this looks good, uh, or this is a good site, this doesn't look good, this isn't a good site, to drill deeper and to find out what makes it. Because we can then use that knowledge, if we talk about what makes for what we consider a good site and we analyze it, all right, we can then keep those things in mind as we develop our own websites. So I want to start off the discussion today about talking about what makes for a, a well-designed website. I will say that there, part of this is a matter of opinion, all right, you, you know. There could be two websites that one person looks at and says is good, one person looks at and says bad. So there is an element of opinion in it. But there's some definite guidelines that we can apply that can sort of make it a bit more objective than that. 
All right. The other thing I will say is in the world of web design, there are very few what I would call hard and fast rules. All right. There are things that are probably generally true. All right. There are guidelines that are probably true in most cases. But for every guideline you can think of, you can probably think of some special circumstances under which you might want to break that guideline. And it's entirely appropriate for the particular project you're working on. The class exa example that I have um, uh, for this is, you know, basic rule of web design is that people should know what your page is when they land on it. You know, for example, boom, we land on this page. That's Lorain County Community College's page. How do I know? It's right there. All right, it's obvious. Go to Cleveland State, go to, you know, any college like that, and it's immediately apparent where you are, or it should be. If it isn't, then we can probably say, hey, that's a problem. But that's not true for all websites. And I'll give you the classic example of that. I would hope someone talks about this in an e-marketing class. I'm Googling a site that's called I Love Bees. Is anyone familiar with this site? Good. All right. I love bees. Welcome to I Love Bees. This is my webpage mostly dedicated to beekeeping. I've been beekeeping for seven years and I'm still learning. I have three hives, blah, 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 blah. That's the Google search results. Let's click on the link. And there we go. All of a sudden, this pops up. All right, what appears to be an ominous looking error, it really isn't. You start poking around. Ooh. What? I see something like that, I leave. Well, I, I know this site, yeah. I, I, I know this site, so, uh, so uh, it, it's safe. If, the, if, if I just, this just randomly popped up, I wouldn't. Here's a little audio clip. All right, this site clearly isn't about beekeeping. What do you think the site is about? What do you think the purpose of the site was? It's no, it's not a virus. Yes. It's actually a game. All right. This, the, the website I Love Bees was a sort of a viral way of promoting when the, the very popular video game Halo first came out. So that website is associated with the game Halo. And what is the logic of this? Well, the logic of this is if you intrigue people and get them hooked and keep a little mystery, they're going to pass it around and look at this site. Boy, this is really weird and so on and so forth. And this is one of the first, and it was an example of a successful viral marketing campaign. Where, and the whole point of it is the website is not very clear about what its purpose is. The navigation isn't very clear. This site broke all the rules of web development or web design. Yet it's a very successful site. Why? How can that be? Because it followed the most prime rule of web design and that is the design should fit the purpose and the content. So the design of this page was meant to ensnare people, make them curious, come back for more, wonder what this is about, and so on. And it was very successful when this came out in doing so. All right? And you can probably find other examples of that as well. In this particular case, again, um, this site was very successful. There's probably some sites that aren't so successful. Now, let's say you're hired by a law firm to build a website for them. Would you take that sort of approach with a law firm? You know, 
I like tomatoes, you know, and have it intriguingly tell the story of this law firm of three lawyers. No, right? Because that's not what people are going to expect or want in that case. In the case of a site for a video game, people want to get hooked. People want to get ensnared. People want a little bit of mystery about it, a little bit of suspense. If you're going to a professional business site, you don't want that. You don't want it to be a mystery to figure out how to order a product, right? It should be very straightforward. So, if I say a site should clearly identify its purpose, that's probably the safest guideline you can give for a website. Yet we can still find effective sites that um, violate that rule. Now, here's the catch. When you do something that sort of goes against the grain, you better know what you're doing or you're going to look ridiculous. It's not going to work. So, I don't remember all that. I, I heard about this after Halo was out. So, I, I, was, I wasn't part of like the, the, the pre-game hype uh, of it. So, I'm not really sure exactly how they spread the word about it and made sure that people found it and realized it, you know, and, and so on. But, this is an example of something that could have just fallen flat and people ignore it. People think, as a couple of people said, that it was a virus or, or something and, and stayed away from it. All right, so let's keep that in mind. If you're doing a site for an ordinary business, yeah, you probably want to play by the book. But, do remember, depending on what you're creating a site for, um, some of these guidelines can be bent. Um, sites that are meant for entertainment, for example. Probably, do, you know, it's probably okay if the navigation isn't quite as clear. Because people don't have the goals of ordering a product or finding out about a company's services or whatever, you know. They're there for entertainment. They want to read stories about whatever the topic is or whatever. See pictures or videos or whatever. Alright, so anyhow, these are guidelines. Alright, let's brainstorm for a while. Let's talk about, and I'd like to hear from each of you, and you can give an example if you want. If not, you can just describe what either makes for a good or a bad website. Alright? And you can probably phrase it either way. You can say what is bad, and if we like turn it on its head, it becomes a positive about what's good about sites. So, what makes for a good or bad website? What are some of the elements? Alright, so I'll, I'll make two of these things. Accurate, timely, information. And that's a good place to start. In fact, one of the famous guidelines for web design is the rule that content is king. Or if you prefer, content is Queen. The idea here is people aren't visiting your site to view pretty colors, to view well designed navigation, to whatever. They're there for your content. What you do design wise is there to showcase your content in the best way possible. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the design elements, but it's always good to remember right off the bat that, hey, most important part of this site is the content that people are going to get. Now, notice accurate and timely information. Those are obviously both key things. I might use a a, a um, 
a, a, a sort of a kind of a synonym for accurate and say credible. All right. That goes along with accuracy, you know, and timely, you know. Um, it, it's, you know, you go to a website and you see information from 2006 and it's kind of like, well, all right, yeah, a lot of stuff has happened since 2006. Is this, is this still relevant? The, go ahead. Up to date. Up to date. Yeah, so keep it up to date. And continually update it, all right? When you visit a site and you see that the most recent thing on it is, you know, several years ago, again, that sort of affects the credibility of it, you know. Then again, if it's a chili recipe, it doesn't matter. Then again, if it's a chili recipe, it doesn't matter. All right. Again, so every guideline is a guideline. Now, <coughs> let's 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 carry that thought through. That's true. If it's a chili recipe, it doesn't matter. But what if it's an online cookbook? All right, you may not expect an individual page on that site to be updated regularly. Hey, we found the world's best chili recipe. Why mess with it? All right. But I would argue that a website where there were updates that had, okay, now we're going to have a quesadilla recipe. Now we're going to have a recipe for um, spaghetti and meatballs. That kind of update would, I think, add credibility to the site. Would, 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 you know, would, would show that the site is active and would make you more likely to go back to it. You know, a site like that, a, a cooking site or a cookbook site, probably relies on its ads for revenue and so on. So getting people to come back would be a goal. And therefore, maybe not updating every individual page, but updating the site would be. What is... Can anyone think of another word to describe the information that we want to find on the site? We talk about it being correct, right? We certainly don't want to put incorrect information, so accurate or credible e either way, uh, I guess depending on the, on the uh, um, context of it, you know. If, if, if you're talking about something that's of a factual nature, you'd want it to be accurate. If you're talking about something that is um, a, uh, you know, maybe more subjective and more opinion based, you at the very least want that opinion to be based on things that are fact, uh, you know, to be able to be backed up with some facts. You know, you can agree or disagree with the conclusions, but that's why I added the word credible there. All right. Any other thing that you can think of as far as the kind of information that's on a page? There's another big word that I would put in there. It's not a big word, but an important word that I would put in there. Interesting. Compelling is another, is another good word. That's not the one that I was thinking of, but that's a great one as well. I'll give you a hint. We'll play Wheel of Fortune. Here. Does one want to guess a letter? R. O. Very good. E. You guys see my notes? Close. No. Relevant. Thank you. Relevant. All right, relevant information. Now, what do we mean when we say the information is relevant? Yes. Okay. The statement was is that if it's a site about something, it, the uh, or a section of a site about something, that the content on there is about that. All right, and they said again. If it's genuinely a site about beekeeping, then on a page about beekeeping, there'd be information about beekeeping and not 15 other things. All right. What's another way that we could look at, well, what's another way that relevancy is important? Organization. All right. Having it organized. What does the word relevant mean?
Okay, on a cooking website, don't talk about Justin Bieber being arrested. All right. So that's not relevant. It's not relevant to the topic at hand. Would there be a difference in relevancy of information if the cooking site was meant for chefs versus meant for ordinary folks making their just getting by trying to make their beef stew in the evening? Relevant to the audience, right. Uh, whenever you talk about relevant, sort of the um, you know, sort of the two things, and, 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 and we definitely hit on the one, and now we hit on the other, is we want, we want it to be relevant to the topic, all right? So we want things organized right. We don't want to mix stuff together. We want to have it well organized. So the page about beekeeping has beekeeping and not Justin Bieber information. Well, let's find someone else to pick on, all right? I mean, I don't even like him, but, you know, I mean, everyone's picking on him. We'll, we'll find someone else to, to pick on next lecture. Um, but it's also relevant to the audience, all right? So you could have a page about cooking, and again, you know, um, if it's meant for, for professional chefs, you could have a discussion about what knife is the best and be comparing and contrasting knives that cost hundreds of dollars. That's relevant to cooking, right? You need knives to cook. Well, yeah, but your average person that's just, you know, making themselves a grilled cheese sandwich, you know, probably can take a plastic knife and cut it in half, all right? And therefore, they don't need that discussion. So anytime you talk about relevance, it's relevant to the topic and relevant to the audience. All right. Pardon me? Did, uh, oh, okay, I thought I heard someone say something. So, a fundamental rule of all communication, and it's a communication whether you're talking about giving a, a speech or making a TV commercial or anything, is to know your audience. Right. That's an important thing to include. Now, I'm going to play the devil's advocate for a second. And I'm going to say, if I'm making a cooking site, and I want to make a good cooking site, why would I not make a cooking site where my audience was professional chefs and ordinary folk that are just trying to make their grilled cheese when they get home from work? And kids that want to make a healthy after, after school snack. And people that run high school cafeterias that have to feed, you know, 100 kids a day. I could make a site where that's, all of those people are my audience. All right? And in that case, then, anything about cooking would be relevant. How to make... 50 hamburgers an hour would be relevant. A discussion of the best cooking knives would be relevant. And an article about how to make an omelet so it doesn't become scrambled eggs would be relevant. All right. It would be too cluttered and too busy. Uh, exactly. Clutter, busy. It's a matter of focus. I, I always wanted there to be like a, a law or a principle named after me. You know, there's like Newton's three laws of motion, and there's Murphy's law, and there's a whole bunch of, of, of things like that. Um, the one thing I propose for Zeller's law is that anything that you put on a website has the potential to distract people from everything else on the website. All right? So... If I'm unfocused, if I have not clearly defined my audience, and I try to mix articles about what a professional chef would need to know with articles of what someone that runs a catering business needs to know, with articles meant for the average person that's just making dinner for themselves and their family, 
all right? That's going to make everything on the site harder to find. It's going to be cluttered, all right? So, therefore, you need to be really in touch with defining specifically who your audience is, all right? And deciding what kind of stuff is relevant to them, all right? Now, to be sure, it's not always that you can say the audience is one group of people, right? I mean, even if you're talking about, let, let's say we, we narrow our cooking site down to a site that's meant for just your average people, right? Still, still, there's, there's a range in what would be relevant to them. There are single people that are making stuff for themselves. There are people that are making for themselves and for a family, all right? There are people that work long hours that are trying to cook for their family and want to figure out a way to, to, to simplify and streamline the process. Um, there's vegetarians. Then there's vegetarians. Then there's people with different um, um, allergies or, or whatever, all right? So, even when you narrow your audience down, so, if for this cooking site, we're no longer talking about everyone in the world that might ever cook, and we've narrowed it down to just your average person that wants to make meals for themselves and their family, even then we have some variations for that. But again, that's something you should think about. The more that you can focus, the better off your results are going to be. You know, you've heard people say about any number of things that, um, you know, you can't be all things to all people, right? And I think a lot of websites try that and try to be all things to all people and end up really solving no one's needs particularly well. Um, I guess we could talk about that on, in terms of web pages or other software, you know. Um, you know, um, I, I typically don't use, and I probably shouldn't say this, but it's the truth, so, you know, the truth shall set you free, as they say. I very rarely use Microsoft Office stuff, all right? Why? For the stuff I do, like the spreadsheet in Google Docs is just as good. I'm just going to put some numbers in and add them up, right? Do I want to integrate with the database and do this and do that and do that? No. Now, to be sure, there's people in the world that that's a great thing for and can serve them. But I would argue some of those applications like Microsoft Office try to be all things to all people. And as a result, they become needlessly complex. So. To the, to the degree that you can focus, the better off you're going to be. To the degree that you're very clear. Now, that's not always possible. You know, you, you know you, you, the, the flip side is also true. You know, you can't, uh, you know, if you develop a website for, you know, a single parent that's raising a group of lactose intolerant vegetarian kids, that may satisfy a couple families in the city really well, <laughs> all right? That may be their ideal website, but it might not be broad enough to get your site the, the kind of exposure that you want. So you're going to try to balance between focusing and flexibility, all right? The more you focus, the better you can address people's needs but you might leave some people out, all right? Let's think for a second about the college website, all right? What are, what is the website for, what is the audience for the website made up of? What are, how would you describe the audience, uh, um, the, the, the groups of people that access LC's website. Oh, okay. 
All right, what was the first one? Current students. Future or potential, we'll say, students. Staff. Alumni. Businesses. Oh, um, you you said alumni. D did I miss any so far? Can anyone think of anyone else? A anything else? Um. Yeah, including maybe recruiters. Probably think of a few more. High schools. Parents of current or future students. Members of the community. A lot of things that go on on campus that aren't particularly, um, you know, related to academics. You know, you have a wonderful stocker center over there that has all sorts of performances. And people in the community might want to know what's going on at Stalker to, to attend events like that. Um, we could, depending on what we wanted to do, we could refine this even further for current, for current or for, for potential students. There are PSEO students. Are there any PSEO students in, in the house? All right, we have one. You can't see it on the screen. You can't see it on the screen, okay. I was going to say nothing personal, but I would not have guessed you as a PSEO student. <laughs> yeah, you never know, but... What is PSEO? PSEO is, I don't know what the letters stand for. Post-secondary enrollment options. Post enrollment options. It's where essentially high school kids can take college classes. And they could come on campus, they can spend part of the day in their high school and part of it on, on, uh, on college. There's also... Um, um, what do they call the high school that's actually housed here? Early college? First college? Early college, yeah. That's true, daycare center. What's another group of future potential students? Well, high school graduates. Okay, displaced workers. Veterans. People that want to change careers. People that want to, I definitely get a lot of this in my classes, people that want to stay current. You know? Uh, for a job under the, uh... Oh, under the other and Yeah, potential employees. All right. So this is, this was what? This was five minutes worth of brainstorming on this, probably. And we came up with a big list. Now, the good news is, is that many of the people here probably uh, share similar goals. All right? Um, for the most part. All right? I think we can add in here transfer students. We could also add here people that are seeking an associate's degree, certification, transfer, university partnership students, and so on. Now many of those probably have some of the same goals, right? All these students would need to like, be able to see what the, the schedule is for summer term, let's say, if they were thinking of, of, of taking summer classes, or would need to see um, um, 
you know, what, what are the requirements for an associates in computer information system and so on, or whatever their degree field is. So there is going to be overlap, all right? But there's a lot of different people that are going to visit the site. When you, and when you talk about a big site, you're going to run into that, all right? Now, if we go and look at our website, and by no means am I holding this up as an example of a perfect website, but we can see how they at least attempted to address some of these issues right across of the top, and I believe this is on every single page. We have links that don't work. No, there we go. Current students, future students. Now notice some of the stuff overlaps. A current student may still need assistance determining what career they want, right? They may have some sort of idea that they want to go into technology or, or business, but they may not know precisely what. So there's a link to choosing a major, and certainly future students, whether they be transfer students or displaced workers or veterans or high school graduates might want some insight about that. Current students and, i um, actually surprised they don't have this on there, but um, a lot of folks are going to be interested in financial aid, right? I mean, any student is going to be interested in that. And then they have a, ta a, a link for business and industry, which has a different set of things, all right? Some of which are in common, some of which aren't. They have, for example, the Bla uh, Blackstone Launchpad, which helps small businesses get going. They have that under business and industry and have that under current students. Because if you're looking at graduating, maybe your goal is to graduate with a degree and start a business. All right. So at least the attempt was made on this site, and again, I'm not holding it up as sort of a perfect example, but it seems like an attempt was made to identify the audience, or audiences is probably a better way to put it, and to focus on the needs and goals of that particular group. All right. So, if I was going to summarize what we have so far, if we look at these things, we, we only, we thought positive, all right, and put them all on the good side. <laughs> if I was going to summarize these things, I would say a good website addresses the goals of its audience. And I'm going to add something on to it, and I'm going to say, and the organization. I think everything we said on that side is contained in that statement. We're not going to be addressing the goals of our audience if we're not providing them with credible, accurate, timely, interesting, and compelling information. All right? That's sort of what addressing the goals means, is providing them something that they need. All right? And those are good words to describe the information, timely, relevant, and so on. 
It has a sense of focusing on the audience. All right. Part of focusing on the audience is defining the audience or the audiences. All right. Now, I added on there the organization, right? Because organizations create websites because, well, for one thing, servicing their customers or potential customers will help them achieve their goal, right? We want to educate people. All right, we want people to um, go through, get their degrees, and, and launch successful careers. So by helping people find classes to take, give them advice about choosing careers, that both serves our customers' goals and that serves our mission as well. All right. Um, there needs to sort of be, and there usually is, sort of an overlap between the goals of the people visiting the site and the organization that creates the site. If you think of Amazon or something, you know, people go there to buy books. Their goal is to find a book to read or some other product. Amazon's goal is to make money by selling books and so on. So there's an overlap there. If Amazon is successful in satisfying their users' goals, then they're going to be satisfying their own goals as well. All right. Now, the one thing that I would add to this, if I could think of a better way to add to it, is avoiding the thought of trying to be all things to all people. I guess that's sort of implied when I talk about who your audience is. Knowing and defining your audience or audiences is critical. Now here's what I mean when I say that I sometimes, I, I, I think I somewhat take a different approach to web design. Because I haven't talked about fonts or colors or anything like that. All right. I've started, by, I've started this discussion talking about what I consider the most fundamental thing. Serving the goals of your defined audience. All right? Serving the goals of your organization. Now, does that mean things like color or fonts or whatever are meaningless? No. They're the means to help us achieve that. All right? By using these different elements, these design elements, we can do a better job communicating than if we just had a very plain website with simply a string of black text on a white background. All right. So, I wanted to start the discussion with that as our focus. What we will do next time is look at some specific visual design features that will help us to get there. All right? You know, a lot of times in businesses or even in the military, they talk about um, strategy, uh, tactics, and then operational things. You know, I think it's always important to have our goal in mind. And our goal is not to create a website that has pretty colors on it. Our goal is to, to solve people's problems to satisfy their goals. Now in doing so, the use of color, the use of different fonts, can help people achieve those goals. And we'll talk about how we can use these specific visual elements to do that. We'll talk about that for a while. If you have some good and bad examples, that's part of your uh, assignment, by the way, Bring them to class, and we can talk about them. And then we'll get into a discussion of what the semester project is all about for that. So we'll probably wrap that up on Thursday. If not, we'll spend a little bit of time next Tuesday wrapping that up. Yes? So to this, this week's homework assignment. Yes. Let's go back to the principles you just summarized here. You're the audience, and 
what you want to see in this week's assignment is explain what we think is good and bad, give you specific examples using the tools you've taught us and shown us in the last right. month or so, and come up with a page that explains this. And that would accomplish our goals. Well, well yeah. Uh, the, the one thing I will add is, is let's look at the assignment. The question was asked about this week's assignment. Let me look at it um, so I can get the exact words. All right. No, that's not it. All right. I want you to find two pages on the internet that discuss web design principles. All right. So we've talked a little bit about it in class. All right. There are a myriad of resources on the web. If you just Google good web design, you'll find a lot of them. So find two of them. Find two sites which are examples of good design. All right. Find two sites that are examples of bad design. These are distinct sets. In other words, two pages about web design. Two well-designed well, uh, sites, two poorly designed sites. Create a page with an external CSS file about good web design. <coughs> Summarize the information you found. So including the stuff that we talked about today, but anything else that you find on the web as well. All right. Provide links to all those six sites that you found. And be sure to say why you find the site is a good site or, or a bad site. As far as the audience go, consider the audience being your classmates. Even though I didn't explicitly say that, you know, this isn't meant for kids. This isn't meant for web design professionals. Um, consider for someone that's learning web design. What, what, you know, it, 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 you know, if someone in a class asked you, "Gee, what's a good well web design page?" You could, you could, uh, you could point them to this page and say, "Here, read this." Questions? Create an external CSS file about good web design? Create a page with. about good web design with an external CSS file. Some punctuation would probably help there. Uh, I'm not sure what, but yeah. Right, right. Well, it's, it is easy. I mean, if I had, had commas or something, that probably would have made it easier. Yes. It says um, create a page. Yes. If we wanted to maybe have links on another page with our different stuff and then our summary on a different one just to make it look If you better. want to do more than is assigned, I will never say no. Okay. Fair enough. If make sure you do at least what you what is required, but like if you choose to take this one and split it into three pages, have at it. Have fun. And do you want links to the ones that we're summarizing as well? Or only yes. to the ones that are good and bad? Links to all of them. Okay. Links to all six. Right. All right. We'll see you up in lamb. <laughs>